Hey South Hills, this month, November, is considered Foster Care Awareness Month. On any given day, there are nearly 437,000 children in foster care in the United States. This is one of the reasons why we are honored and excited to be partnering with an incredible organization during this month. Olive Crest is an amazing organization that is dedicated to preventing child abuse by strengthening, equipping, and restoring children and families in crisis one life at a time. They care for entire families by offering support and services like preventative care, fostering, adoption, assistance for young adults, and so much more. You may not know this about me, but bringing awareness to foster children is really close to my heart. And the reason why is because this is the avenue and the road that God allowed me to become a dad. When my wife and I decided to start having children, we assumed that we were gonna have children like most people do. And for some reason, that was not the avenue that God had in mind for us. As we started to attempt to have children, year after year, we had come across challenges of not being able to. And as we consulted with doctors, we came to realize that there was no reason for us to not be able to have children. But at the end of the day, it wasn't God's plan. And so sure enough, as we looked at all the different avenues, we decided to go down the road of foster adoption. And we came across an amazing opportunity for us to be blessed with amazing children that we absolutely love and adore and that could not be better children for us. It has been the greatest joy of my heart to be able to be a father, to be able to raise children, to be able to provide a home for them, to be able to allow God to speak into their hearts and see their gifts and their passions be explored, to be able to live a life that God has called them to. As we have gone down this journey, so many people have looked at us and said, man, what an amazing opportunity you've provided for those kids. And I say, you got it all wrong. Those kids have changed my life and allowed me to be a father that God had called me to be. Were their lives changed? Absolutely. But my life was changed in this process. And I'm excited to see what next story is gonna be coming out of our South Hills Church, where someone sitting in a seat today is gonna to open up a prayer and open up their heart and say, God, is this the road you have for me? Is this the journey that you have in store for me to be able to be a father or a mother or to have a family? Or God, are you simply just asking me to be involved with this organization? Whatever the journey is for you, I'm just asking for you today to consider what can you do to make a difference inside the lives of these children? And I'm excited to see how God will use us as a church, as individuals to make a difference in the lives of the kids and families in our communities. Today, we are kicking off a brand new series. We are kicking off a brand new series. If you're visiting us for the first time, my name is Efren Peña, and I am the campus pastor here at uh, South Hills. Uh, it is truly an honor to have you with us this morning. Um, we are kicking off a brand new series titled Bless, right? And this is a much much needed series on the handling of or what the Bible calls stewardship of money, right? And so uh, this is how to live a, uh, live a truly blessed life. Like we've all seen our fair share of posts where someone brags about how blessed they are. It usually involves a photo of them wearing something, doing something, driving something, eating something, or going somewhere that's desirable, that's probably expensive. And so the question is, is that it? Is that what blessed means? Is being blessed basically getting what you want or having more than what you need? Or is it something bigger? Is it something better or broader? Jesus talked. Jesus talked a lot about um, what it means to live a blessed life. He seemed to think it ought, it, it ought to be our primary pursuit. But what did he mean by that? What do you mean to pursue 
being blessed? Does his definition match ours? What does being blessed look and feel like? How does someone access being blessed? And why do so many people choose not to do it? And so throughout this entire month, we're going to be talking about this blessed life. So I want to start this series off with kind of a foundational message, kind of a, a you need to get this message, today's message, in order to understand and grab on to the following messages throughout this month, right? Because if we don't get today's message, then every message following was kind of, it's kind of, it's going to be a blur. It's going to be a blur to us, right? So we need to grab on to today. So do what you got to do. Take pictures of my notes on the screen. Write down your own notes or however you need to do it. But today is going to go fast. It's going to be a lot of information. And some of these things are going to make you go, hmm, I wonder how that applies to me. All righty? So today's message is titled, Does Blessed Mean What You Think It Means? Does blessed mean what you think it means? Let me ask you this. When was the last time you see someone post something on social media, whether it's Facebook, TikTok, IG, wherever, right? And they they hashtagged it blessed. They showed something, a picture of something, whatever it was, and they said, Man, I'm they're claiming I am blessed. Chances are that was not too long ago, right? Because people do it on the reg. Listen, hashtag blessed is a thing. It exists. It's out there. People post about it alongside all sorts of of images these days, right? A new car, blessed. A new house, blessed. A new pair of sneakers, blessed. A new jewelry, blessed. A new this, blessed. Or this or that. They're always hashtagging blessed because people feel blessed. You see, our culture sees being blessed as getting what you want and having more than you need so that you can live an enviable or desirable lifestyle. And that sounds great, church. It really does. But is that what it really means? Getting what you want and having more than you can live so that you can live, excuse me, an uh, enviable or desirable lifestyle. Because here's the thing, we see the same sorts of posts, we see the same sort of posts and quotes and and thoughts from, from Christians too. Look at this new car, look at this limited pair of sneakers, this amazing vacation, I'm blessed. And there's reason, right, there's, there's a reason they think that. And that reason may even stem Scripture. They're feeling blessed because of something that they read in Scripture or they understood from Scripture. You've heard me say this before up here in our time of offerings, but James chapter 117, I'm actually rephrasing Scripture when I say it, but here it says in verse 17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. I say that every good and perfect gift comes from his hand. And the thought around this is that if you have something good, if you have something good, it's a blessing from God. And that's true. If you have something good, it is a blessing from God. So, If you look around your life and have all the good things that money can buy, are you blessed? Not everyone seems to think so. And a lot of times, those who have the most agree with with that idea the least. A few of these conversations are the ones people had with Jesus. In Matthew 19, I'm going to summarize it real quick. This is, this is about the rich young ruler. 
And he comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Right? What do I need to do? And Jesus said, well, you need to follow the commandments. He goes, well, I've done that. I follow the commandments. And Jesus says, well, now go and sell everything you've got. And then give that money to the poor. And then you need to follow me. And this rich young ruler left the conversation feeling sad. He felt sad because he had many possessions. You see, church, something is missing in this guy's life, even though he has so much. That's why he approaches Jesus. He's not asking how to get to heaven later. No, he's asking how to live a blessed life in the here and the now. How can I live, Jesus? How, Jesus, how can I live a full life? His culture will tell him that he is blessed. But for some reason, he doesn't feel blessed. And he wants to know why. Why is he not feeling blessed? What is off? What is he missing? Church, we all know people like this. People who seem to have it all, but yet are struggling to enjoy it or find much meaning in it. Thus, it's a great question. What does it mean to be truly blessed? An incredible question. What does it mean to be truly blessed? Because all of us are convinced, if I had what they had, whoo, I feel blessed. I would feel blessed. Truth is, that's not always the case. Elsewhere, Jesus gives a whole sermon on what it means to be blessed. And everything he said was counterintuitive to a culture that equated blessing with wealth. Let me give you some highlights from Matthew 5. These are the Beatitudes, right? And he says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven. Is theirs. And then he says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. So wait. <laughs> so, 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 so we can all kind of grasp this. You can be poor and blessed, and wealthy and not blessed, but you can also be poor and not blessed, and wealthy and blessed. The Apostle Paul says it in the New Testament of, of, of he and his friends, 2 Corinthians, our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. What does that mean? It's a paradox built on a principle many uh, of Jesus' teachings revolve around, including several parables. Just in case you don't never heard that word before, a parable is a simple made-up story, right, told by a single, uh, told by, uh, told to make a single idea understandable and, and, and unforgettable. And Jesus uses these a lot. And this morning, I want to unravel one together, okay? And that is found in Matthew 25, and this is the parable of the talents. Maybe you've read this before, and it's on the screen. We're going to start with verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and what? Say that with me. Entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Let's say that word once again, entrusted, right? Verse 15, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to the other, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. 
So he entrusts them with what's his. You follow along already so far? He's entrusting them with what belongs to him. That's maybe the, the most important information in this entire illustration. He didn't give it to them or loan it to them. He entrusted it to them. In other words, it's his, not theirs. He's saying, hold on to this for me and take care of it for me. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example, kind of break this down. Have you ever been to a nice hotel? Nice is the key word here. You entrust your luggage to a porter or a bellhop, also could be known as a steward, right? You're not giving it to them or loaning it to them to do as they please. You're entrusting them. You're entrusting what's yours to them to take care of it on your behalf and make sure that it gets to where it's supposed to go. Everybody done that before? All right, you bring out, they bring a little card, you give them the luggage. Some of you who are just like never done that before, but like, where's he gonna go with it? <laughs> is he making a pit stop somewhere? Why'd he go left and I went right? What's up with that? Why can't I go in that elevator with him? Right? But that's what we're doing. We're entrusting this person with our goods. And play along with me. Imagine if you saw them right after you entrusted them going through your suitcase or wearing your clothes and you confronted them and they said to you, well, you gave it to me. You'd be like, no, I didn't give it to you. It's not for you to keep. It's for you to steward, to make sure that it gets from here to here. Now, church, if you don't understand who owns what in this parable, it won't make sense. It won't make sense. And I would argue that if you don't understand who owns what, who owns what in your story, it won't make sense either. I want you to hold on to that thought. If you don't understand who owns what in your own story, it won't make sense. So here's what these people in this story do. Matthew 25, going to verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they used his money. Called to give an account is a, a very bible phrase of saying, what did you do with what you had? What did you do with what you had? Not what you would have done if you had actually gotten what you deserved. Not what you were planning to do or intended to do. But what did you do with what you had? Did you make the most of it? Are you proud of it? Was it fulfilling? Did it matter? Did you make a difference? Did you steward it well for the one who actually owns it? Those are some very good questions when it comes to this. Just for the sake of it, steward, and the, we're using the word steward as a verb, right, which means to manage or look after. So let's keep reading in verse 20. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver, came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. 
The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Oh, yeah, let's celebrate. That's my favorite word, celebrate. (laughs) The master gives the two who invested what they were entrusted well even more. So they were given something, they handled it, they entrusted it, they stewarded well what they were given. And so the master says, I'm going to give you more. Because apparently the master has much more, way more than just what he entrusted these three with. I like this guy because this guy operates from a place of Sufficiency, not scarcity. He's a giver. He's a giver. Let's keep reading. Verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. Uh Uh-oh. He's calling them out. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvest, I could see him. If you knew I I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. That's when that servant goes, oops. The master's upset church, not because his servant did anything bad. He's angry because he didn't do anything at all. He didn't do anything. How many of you know that you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right? Yes? Sometimes... We think that by not doing anything at all kind of kind of puts us in the middle. We won't get in trouble. We won't get called out. That doesn't necessarily mean that you did something right. The point of Christianity, and I want you to take a picture of this or jot this down because this is important for your walk. The point of Christianity isn't to simply avoid doing the wrong things, but to actively pursue doing the right things. That makes sense? You can't go around saying, oh, yeah, I just cannot do this. I cannot do that. No. What you need to do is actively pursue doing the right things. Because when you're pursuing doing the right things, you don't have time to do the wrong things. I heard an amen in there. Thank you for that. Someone is following with me this morning. Church life is about more than consumption, comparison, and competition. It's about contribution. It's about leveraging what God has given to you to better the world around you. It's about taking what God has blessed you with and seeing how you can make the world around you better. Let's keep reading verse 28. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Verse now, verse 30, now throw these useless, this useless servant into the outer darkness. Now, here's what you need to know about parables, church. When Jesus uses parables, there's always, they're they're always about something more than what they're about. There's a lesson to be learned here. There's something that, that Jesus wants us to grab onto, to comprehend. If you want to get the most out of a parable, 
then it's going to be helpful to ask yourself a couple of really, really important questions. Number one, who is God in the story? So when you read a parable that Jesus talked about, you need to ask yourself in the story, who is God in this story? And number two, who am I in this story? Because the lesson is for us to learn. Does that make sense? Now, I, not, I, I may not be able to answer the second one, the second question for you, but I can definitely answer the first one. God, God is playing the role of the master in this story, in this parable. The one who owns it all. And so by default, You're the servant. There's no other characters in the story. And so the question comes about, are you living your life with that realization that God is the master and that you are the servant? Friends, listen, until you understand, until you grab onto this, until it kind of seeps into your heart, God is the owner and that you are the steward, you'll be annoyed with what he asked you to do with what he's entrusted to you because you'll feel entitled to what doesn't belong to you. Until you understand that he owns it all, that he is the master, that every good and perfect gift comes from his hand, and that he's entrusted you with that, for you to be the steward of that, to take care of it, to do incredible things with it. Until you grab onto that, you're going to have a really difficult time understanding or coming to terms with this entire series because you're going to want to feel entitled to it all. You see, being blessed isn't the result of getting you what, getting everything that you want and having more than you need. It's actually living with a sense of satisfaction, fulfillment, wholeness, and peace. It's being able to enjoy and find contentment in all sorts of situations, living open handedly with all that you have because it's not yours to begin with. You see, it's a gift. It's all a blessing. You know what I would have thought if I were the one with the least amount? Of course these people feel blessed. They got more than me. Right? That's what the world teaches us. Of course, they, they, of course they're going to hashtag blessed. They got more resources than me. But that's the point, church. Living blessed isn't based on how much you have, but how you view and what you do with what you do have. Amen? Take a picture of this. Write this down. This is important. Because this, I believe, is going to change your life. Once we begin to grab onto this, we're going to see things in a whole different world. I think the third, I think like the third steward in this story, we think to ourselves, man, if I had more, I'd do something significant and important with it. If, if I only had more, I'd honor the master with it. He gave them more, but he only gave me a little bit. What am I supposed to do with a little bit? I got to look out for myself first. But he gave you he gave you what he thinks that you can handle right now, church. And if you think he's underestimated you, invest what you've got in his kingdom causes and watch as he entrusts you with even more. That makes sense? As we become good stewards, some of us are just not good stewards. Let's just call it what it is. We're just not good stewards. 
And we keep looking for more and looking for more. And God is asking, what have you done with what I've given you? But you need to give me more, God. I like, he God is like, I can't give you more because you haven't done well with what I've given you. Church, this is how life works. Sometimes you will have a lot, and at times, at other times, you will only have a little bit. The key is trusting God in both seasons with everything that you've been entrusted with. During COVID, many of us bound the hatches, locked the doors, didn't want to take a phone call, didn't want to look at anybody because you felt like someone's going to ask you for something. You were like, oh, no, things are break. This, no, we need to bunker down. We need to keep it tight knit. We can't, we can't give nothing to nobody. Paul makes one of the most courageous and admirable claims in the scripture, in all of scripture in Philippians 4, verse 10, he says, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Verse 12, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Check this out. Some of us love that ending scripture. We love that scripture. We're talking about, oh, I got to take the groceries. I can do anything who strengthens me through Christ, right? So I'm like, you got to move your furniture. You got to move. Like, we use that scripture all out of place. When this scripture was meant to reference, listen, even if you have a little bit, God is still going to sustain you. God is still going to take care of you. So quit yapping and start trusting more. Amen? Don't get me started in here. I got to preach at the Korean service. (laughs) Church, this is impressive. The scripture is so impressive, especially at the end of it, because it's hard to do that. No matter which end of the spectrum you're on, right? The truth is we all exist somewhere on the spectrum between abundance and absence. We all are somewhere in between that. Either we have a lot or we have a little. God has put you in the place he thinks that you can handle at the moment, but that doesn't make it easy. It's all tough. The reason people all along the spectrum struggle to live blessed is that it always requires something sacrificial from them. No matter where you are, it requires a great deal of trust. Trust in God that he will not only meet your need, but that he will exceed your needs. You want to know why sports athletes, multimillionaire athletes are broke? Because they don't trust. Because they feel like they don't have enough. Because they don't understand what it is to be a good steward of their resources. And so they're out there making infomercials at 4 o'clock in the morning. That was funny. That was a joke. <laughs> Somebody would be like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Church, if you are experiencing an absence, you're in a season of absence, will you become tight-fisted because you're afraid you'll run out, that, uh, run, run out or that God won't provide or you might have to trust yourself more than you trust him or you have too little to be generous or selfless with? And if you're experiencing a season of abundance, will you give an extra, give extra because you have extra? Will you see all the extra as a gift from God so that you can be generous and meet the needs of others and better your community or just better your home, your wardrobe, your next vacation? So Paul gives us a guidance on how to cultivate that trust no matter where we are on the spectrum. 2 Corinthians 9 says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. 
In the same way, he will provide and increase and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. In other words, God uses us to bless others. And what Paul is trying to hammer home here is how, write this down, take a picture, how you think about and what you do with your money has a lot to do with your level of satisfaction in life. What you, how you think about and what you do with your money has a lot to do with your level of satisfaction in life, which is why whenever people approach Jesus feeling disappointed with their life, he often circled back that conversation to their patterns and practices with money. Because being a giver may not be a requirement of salvation, but it is a requirement for satisfaction. Want to find that full life? Be a giver. Be generous. John 10.10 10 says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Let me close. The Blessed Life Church is something that we tap into when we trust Jesus by the way, by the living, by living the way he says it's best. Are you searching for that blessed life? Then we need to find out exactly how Jesus is asking us to live our lives so we can tap into that. And trust is a product of ongoing discipline, not a single decision. It's an ongoing, continuous pattern of life. Strengthening our trust in God requires that we do something stretching, requiring us to rely on God. If you go to the gym, you lift weights, right? Part of getting bulk getting stronger, it's going to require you to push the boundaries, to stretch, to add more weight, right? It's the same process in our trust in God. It's going to require you to kind of push the limits. Getting spiritually stronger, it's about the tension, putting yourself under the tension intentionally trusting God in bigger and scarier ways for longer seasons in every area of your life, especially in the hardest, your finances. So what should your spiritual workouts look like moving forward? In other words, what practices might you need to implement to move toward a mindset of gratitude and generosity? What are the things that you're going to have to do differently than what you've been doing in order to trust God more? Because the reality is, church, it's possible to truly be blessed in a season in which you have the least. It's possible because you're willing to see and steward all you have as if it were God's, as if he was the master, as if he was the owner. And I believe with all my heart that if we look at our finances and we look at our lives and we see ourselves in the story and say, well, he's He's the owner, and I've been called to be the steward of it. 
Every good and perfect gift comes from his hand. He's entrusting me to do right, to be a good steward. Even if the season I'm in is a season of absence or a season with the least, I've been called to be a good steward. I've been called to live a life that lines up with his life. And that kind of living is increasingly satisfying, church. When you can sit down on your sofa or at the coffee table or in bed and say, man, I'm living that generous life. I'm a giver. I'm being a good steward of the resources that he has given me. Does that preach? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's okay. Listen, I get it. It's okay to be like, oh, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. You're going to continue to say, I don't know, until you try it. Until you try how God is asking us to live, to live open-handed instead of tight fist. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we bless you, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, Lord. We thank you for your word that comes forth with power, authority, and anointing. We thank you, Lord, that your word begins to stir something in our hearts and in our spirits, Lord. And it causes us to want to be different, to take heed and say, man, how can I apply what I've learned today? I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want it to go in through one ear and out the other. Instead, I want to hear it and begin to live it and make it a part of my daily life. Lord, help us to live according to your word. Help us, Lord, to apply what we've heard, to be good stewards and to arrive at this blessed life, life to the fullest that you came to give us. To you be all the glory and all the honor. In your name we pray. Amen, amen.